it's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Tibor Shanto. Author, speaker, sales consultant, and the principal of Renbor Sales Solutions in Toronto, Canada. And you can find him online at sellbetter.ca. Tibor, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you here today. So rather than have me sort of go through some standard biographical data you might have sent me, is, is tell us about yourself. You know, what do you do and who do you do it for? Um, so I guess I do what I call professional development for professional salespeople. Um, we used to call it sales training, but I think, you know, professional development is a bit more direct as to what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I work exclusively with, uh, with B2B companies and a lot of the work that I do is focused on new business acquisition, which generally comes in one of two forms. The obvious is getting brand new logos to come on board. The other one, which I think is as much of an opportunity for a lot of my clients, is how do they go deeper and wider within existing accounts, whether that's with different product lines or new budgets or any different combinations. And so with that, I tend to focus on sales process because I think having a workable process is is important. And I know some salespeople don't like process. They find it's a bit cumbersome. So think of it as an actionable uh, roadmap for your sale. If the word process bothers you, right? There's a lot of people in sales that seem to find the word process. And I could relate. Early in my sales days, one of my managers kept complimenting me how process-oriented I was, and I couldn't figure out what she was talking about. Uh, but I guess I was doing things in sort of a systematic and repeatable way, and she found that interesting. So I can relate, but I also think that salespeople need to calm down a little and not get hung up on the word, but think about what it could do for them to help them be more successful. But yeah, I think some people, even some sales leaders I talk to, when you say the word process, they roll their eyes. And, you know, I get it, but I don't think it's as frightening as some would make it out to be. No. I think it goes to an issue that I'm sort of always beating on about is that, you know, a process that's put a spotlight on things and one of the things it brings with it is accountability. Right. So with that in place, generally what we find is that it opens up a number of different discussions. So once you have a process in place, how well are, are, are the salespeople executing it? So a lot of my work and one of my taglines is that success in sales is about execution. Everything else is just talk. So once you have that process, it's really easy to focus on the execution and begin to make adjustments. Um, and that's a continuous process because as you make improvements in your execution and as the market changes, you need to update your process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the challenges that organizations have is they'll craft a process in 1995. And in some places, you see the same process in place today, 20 years later. So it needs to continuously update and evolve. Yeah, at least take into account email, for goodness sakes. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, and these days, you know, there's still some, uh, I still get pushback when I suggest to people that they could prospect using text, um, <laughs> even though probably most people under 30, the easiest way to get to them is text. Right. And I do a lot of work around prospecting because ultimately the kind of companies I work with and maybe it's self-fulfilling prophecy, um, they are, a lot of them are in a competitive environment and they want to win competitive business without resorting to price. And a number of them are close to being commoditized. A number of them are going through conversions where they're moving from selling things to selling managed services. So that's a new narrative. It's a new audience. So again, a lot of the work that I do ends up being around prospecting. And then how do they articulate value or how do they define value with their customers? Mm -hmm. And then a small bit of the work that I do with some of these larger companies is working with their managers, but I don't claim to be a sales management expert, I help them implement and perpetuate what I put into practice. So I help them manage the process that we have in place, but that doesn't encompass the broader requirements of successful sales management. Okay. It, but, you know, those are, and then some part of my business is working with smaller businesses. The concept would be the outsourced VP of sales. So I work with them 
over six months to a year, helping them put a sales structure in place, bring some people on, and groom the person that's going to take over the, the day-to-day. Got it. So how, how did you get your start in sales? Accidentally, I think, like most of us. Um, back, I would say, in the early 80s, um, a friend of mine suggested that I buy this stock, and I'd never purchased stocks before. And in about a week or so, I made a hefty sum of money. And I said, this is good. Let's do it again. And then in about a week or so, I lost most of that money back to the market. And so I thought there must be more to this than just taking tips from a friend. And so I decided to take the securities course here in Ontario. You have to go through a formal program to, Mm -hmm. at that time, become registered as a rep. And part of the condition was that you had to work for an organization that was licensed by one of the two bodies that that administer things up here, um, your equivalent of the SEC. And right. to do that, so with that came the job that, you, you know, the easiest job for them to put you on while you're studying and getting your license is to get on the phone and begin the process. We didn't sell securities right away because we weren't licensed, but we were selling the firm itself in terms of getting people on mailing lists and all that. And that was snail mail for those listening was an email. Um, So that was my first exposure to working on the phone. And I still credit some of my success to that work because they really got you to use the phone and and really understand the power of the telephone and and, and the spoken word and so on in sales. And still a lot of the work that I do is around not just the content, but the dynamics of what happens when you're prospecting and when you're on that pressure-filled situation of a cold call. I'm still a firm believer in cold calling. Mm -hmm. Um, So that then led to a number of positions around around the financial services area, again, primarily selling or support role and so on. And then one thing led to another, and in the early 90s, I found myself with a position with uh, Dow Jones. At that time, it was called Dow Jones News Retrieval. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I'd i met them because I worked for a local organization that was distributing Dow Jones up here in Canada. Um, I wasn't happy with the organization. Through the grapevine, I found out that Dow Jones wasn't happy with the distribution of their product at the time. So... After some introductions, they hired me to sell the product directly up here initially in Ontario and then eventually across Canada. And then at one point, I was sales director for Canada and the Midwest of the U.S., so from Illinois right down to the Texas coast. Mm -hmm. And then around 2001, I found myself in an interesting position of being called director of sales strategy which at the time was supposed to be primarily to roll out a CRM globally, which if you think about it is not the worst job in the world, um, despite all the trials and tribulations around CRM. But if you recall, the, we had the implosion of the dot-com and right. we had 9-11 and the popular phrase in late 2001, early 2002 was right-sizing, right. which was the secret code word for laying people off. Oh, I thought it was the code word for starting your own consulting business. Yeah, well, it was for some. I came in the next wave. Um, so uh, we, what we found out is that our people were really good relationship managers and good salespeople, but because they had written the tide of the internet in the late 90s, um, they weren't very good at prospecting and managing pipelines actively. Right. So they said, well, you're the director of sales strategy. I think at the time Canada had always per capita done better than some of the other regions. So I got tapped to develop a training program, which in hindsight I probably at the time wasn't qualified for, but I immersed myself in different things relating to sales and sales books and readings and methodologies and so on. And that's where I made the left turn, right turn, depending how you look at it, into sales training. And by this time, I was living down in Princeton. And around 2004, when it was time to move back to Toronto, you're sort of at that fork in the road. And somebody suggested that maybe I could do the type of thing that I was doing internally and turn it into a business. So that's when my wave of consulting came along. Um, And in 2004, I started Renbor Sales Solutions. By the way, I'm not big on being called a consultant for a humorous reason. Um, I don't know if you remember back around 2002, UPS had a series of 
commercials called What Could Brown Do For You? Yeah, yeah, I do remember, yeah. So if you do a search on YouTube and you do UPS consultant commercial, there's a commercial that I still use in presentations where two clearly consulting guys because they had a jacket on but no tie um, and they just finished making a presentation to a business owner and the business owner with a smile and the light on his face says, great, let's make it happen. And the two guys at the other end of the desk I do, I do remember this, yeah. Yeah, have this puzzled look and they go, no, no, we don't do what we propose. We just propose. Right. So since I put a lot of emphasis on execution, I want to differentiate myself from that consulting uh, All right. Guess, in post-production, image. We'll, in post-production, we'll edit that out. That's okay. I don't mind. I just find it humorous. I do want to remind people that at the end of the day, it is about the execution. Right. So was there any, besides you know, what's happening externally, what was the mission you thought you were going to solve with your business when you started it? Other than world hunger and peace in the Middle East? Yeah. Um, you know, it really, if you... If you sort of look before, if you look at that 20 years between 83 slash 84 and 2004 when I went on my own, in some ways people who know me will tell you that that was the anomaly. Came out of Coming out of school, I started a couple of small businesses, nothing exciting, but they were independent and I was making decent cash and I was you know, more or less self-dependent and independent, which I think go hand in hand. Um, so I think by the time 2004 came around, I was looking for a quiet place to do my thing and and, and become a little bit, uh, allow some creativity to come out that maybe in the corporate setting isn't always, you know, there. So I don't think, I think mostly I was trying to get a little peace and quiet and just do things on my own that reflected more of me than I was able to reflect in the corporate world. So other than, you know, world hunger and peace in the Middle East, that was about the key thing. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on that peace in the Middle East one. <laughs> so you're working behind the scenes? I am, yes. Okay. Every every night, BB calls me and seeks my advice. He seeks your advice, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. He hasn't ever called me. Well, you didn't tell the world that you wanted to get peace. <laughs> I guess peace that's true. I should have done that. That's right. So it, uh, this is sort of maybe uh, digressing a little bit, but... Yeah, you've worked in both the U.S. and Canada. You worked with is is there a cultural difference in sales between the two? Yes, there is. And what uh, is that? I think you know. I always I always often say that if I set up my business in Buffalo, which is about you know a ninety minute drive down the road, if I did nothing differently, I would make about twenty percent more. I think you know, and I say this with a great compliment that Americans are much more willing to invest in their success. And that's not to say that Canadians aren't, but I'm talking very much from a sales point of view. It's not the broader other aspects of what people do to be successful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think Americans are not more entrepreneurial, but they buy into that whole American dream, capitalism and all that. And while it might have some sides that rubs people the wrong way, I think it's a fairly positive thing and i think they're willing to invest in the success of their salespeople. they realize and that's not to say again that canadians don't i think it's degrees and willingness and the propensity to do it so i find that americans tend to act a little bit faster um than canadians you know somebody else that's a co-acquaintance um tim herson and i don't know if you're going to be speaking to him mm -hmm. But he has an interesting analogy. It escapes me right away, but when he said it, we all cracked up because there is uh, a tangible difference. But it's a subtle difference. So I don't think, you know, if you sort of came over from France, you may not notice it right away. But having managed American salespeople and Canadian salespeople and so on, there is a difference. And it's a bit of a different energy. And I guess it's the type of energy that, at the risk of offending my Canadian friends, there's a slightly better buzz when it comes to selling in the states and does that get reflected in in you know what happens in front of the customer i think so and i think it also gets reflected in the customer's expectations which i guess partly allows for that difference there is a reality that to some degree you know there is the the folks down in the states are less subdued and that works on both sides of the table and i think that makes sales training a little bit different down there. And I think, you know, when you talk to a lot of, when I talk to a lot of salespeople and you ask them what they do, 
folks in the states are most likely to say that they sell. So if you talk to two guys in the financial services industry, one was from Canada, one was from the states. The guy from Canada will say they're in financial services. The guy in the states will say that they sell. Mm -hmm. What they do may not be all that different, but I think it's that attitude that makes it a little bit different in the states. And again, I'm not complaining. I think you know. I enjoy what I do here in Canada and so on, and I chose to move back to Canada, and I think, you know, both countries are great. I love being up here, but if you ask me from a very narrow filter of sales, there's probably an edge in the States. Okay. Well, good. Well, we're going to talk more to Timor Shanto after the break. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll get away from that, <laughs> that culturally sensitive uh, topic. And he's going to talk to us about a methodology that, that he teaches to clients called the Gap Selling Methodology. Well, we'll be right back. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on demand service which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Welcome back. My guest today is Tibor Shanto. Catch Tibor online at sellbetter.ca. And so I want to pose a scenario for you, hypothetical scenario, before we talk about the gap selling methodology sure. that we talked about before the break. So. So when you're a new sales manager and you're being brought into a company to help sort of reinvigorate their sales and you're really under pressure to make things happen quickly. So what would you do in the first week? What two things could you do in the first week that would have the most impact? So first thing I would inspect what metrics are in place and how those metrics are reflected in expectations around the salespeople's activities. Okay. Um, and then I would align those. And, and the simplest form and the way to do that is to work backwards from your goals. So let's make it simple because I'm not good with math without a calculator, that is. Um, so let's say your goal was a million two. So that means you have to do 100000 a, a month in sales. And let's say your average sale was $25,000. So, you know, you have to do four sales a month. You'd be surprised how many people can't even tell you that much. Mm-hmm. Um, so then from there, okay, so what does it take for you to get a $25,000 sale? Simply put, how many proposals would you have to submit to get that 25000 So again, a lot of people don't know that numbers. So that's where I say metrics come into place. Um, how many people in discovery or information gathering will actually move to a proposal with you? So again, so there's a metric there. And then how many people do I have to go out and engage with to get an initial meeting, an initial engagement by phone, face-to-face, -face, web, whatever the case might be, right. in order to get people to enter into a discovery process with me? So with that set of metrics, I would then focus on the activity and making sure that people are doing that level of activity and helping them. One of the things that I find that is you know, instantly makes a difference for a lot of the clients that I work with is the work that I do around time allocation. I'm not a big proponent of time management because it already comes pretty well managed, 60 minutes, 24 hours, seven days, et cetera. But what are the high value activities that you need to allocate time to? So in order to answer that question, you need to know where your strengths and weaknesses are as, as, as an individual rep and so on. So if those metrics aren't easily available because they don't have a CRM or what have you, I would, again, do some rough calculation and set some expectations around the activity into place. And then working with the salespeople, because I do believe in active management, not micromanagement, we would then be able to figure out what does Andy need, what does you know Steve need, what does Heather need, and what's the right level of activity for that rep, and then help them achieve that level of activity. And from there, you can begin to implement a coaching plan because if let's say you and I decide that for Henry we need to improve his proposal to close rate we can put a coaching program into that if for Heather the reality is that she gets good engagement but can't move people through the proposal but once she gets the proposal she does well then how can we help her do a better job of information gathering and discovery so she can take more of those people and convert them into proposals and so on I like it there you go. Hire me. All right. 
I will. You're on. <laughs> there you go. Do you find there's a sub- substantive difference between generations of salespeople? I mean, are millennials that everybody talks about it? I mean, do they have really different in terms of how you have to manage them and coach them, help them become, develop them professionally, as you talk about? I mean, versus anybody else? I don't think so. I mean, and people will say that my, my, my response is biased by age, but I think the packaging has tra- changed dramatically. But I think the motivation and, and the reason that people do things, which I think is more important than how they do things, um, is it, not that different. Um, if people want to plow through, I do articles for one of the Canadian papers. I saw this interesting study about millennials, and it was talking about how different they are. But I'm old enough to remember the hippies, and they look pretty close to the hippies. <laughs> yeah, so, and then those hippies became Republicans, you know. Uh, yeah, that's true. Many of them did. <laughs> yeah. So I find that on the core, no. On the surface, definitely, and and people like me have to make adjustments for that. But only on the sort of delivery level, not the intent and underlying things. All right. So let's talk about your gap selling methodology. So. What's the sales problem? Well, first of all, you know, explain what it is and what's the sales problem it's addressing. Okay, so I always find it amusing and I would say one reason that I would sort of things have changed for me since the book that I co-wrote with somebody is there's always a, a thing among salespeople that there has to be some pain, some need in place to be able to make a sell. Ask any group of salespeople, if you meet a prospect, what do you want to know? The majority will say, I want to know what their pain point is. Mm-hmm. I want to know what their needs are. And that's, you know, sort of an element of the 70s when consultative and solution selling sort of came to the fore. And if you look in, in, in my book, there's this big emphasis on window of dissatisfaction. And, you know, again, I'm not a firm believer in that, but sometimes, you know, co-writing a book is an interesting exercise in compromise. Um, so after the book came out, I was reading around and I saw this interesting um, article and there were several of them but I went to a book by two guys called Bell and Patterson customer loyalty guaranteed and there's been other studies that I could cite since then that confirm the same stat but what they showed is that 75% of people who switch from one vendor to another so they go from Verizon to at and mm-hmm. or whatever the case might be said that they were satisfied or completely satisfied at the time they switched so that sort of pokes a big hole in this pain need stuff because if they were satisfied by implication or extremely satisfied, they would be no pain or no need. So I did a lot of thinking around, well, what would have motivated these people to switch? Because the premise was that it wasn't because they got five cent discount. Um, And where I landed around is that every business person, whether they're actively looking or whether they're thinking about looking or that big group of buyers known as the status quo that most pundits will tell salespeople to stay away from because there's no pain, there's no need, they're satisfied. You know, but all those business people have objectives. So the question is, how can I realign the narrative to talk to their objectives and get them to talk about where perhaps there's a gap between where they are now and where their objectives are? Mm-hmm. And so... Again, I, I, I start all my programs with a, what I call an actionable definition of value. So again, back to that execution stuff. And I define value because if you talk to five salespeople and ask them to define value, you probably get seven definitions because the first two will change their mind based on what the next three say. So if you have that moving target, it's hard to to, to really act on it. So the actionable definition of value, it's on the website, so it's not a secret is anything that I could do to help a customer or a prospect really move closer to their objectives to overcome gaps, hurdles, obstacles, whatever the case might be, and that can get them closer or all the way to their objectives, they're going to see value in. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a discussion around what your pains are, because pains are, everybody knows about them and they're only impacting a small part of the market and I could take an aspirin and probably, you know, march on for the rest of the day. But if I can talk to the objectives, which are more uplifting, because that's where customers want to get to, um, then I can begin a dialogue that will get them to talk to me about where they want to go and perhaps why they're not there. And I can give you a very concrete example from my world. Mm-hmm. Um, when I meet with a VP of sales and we get through the small talk and all that, you know, one of the early questions that I'll ask them is how much of their business comes from 
new customers versus existing customers. And, you know, they'll tell me, and generally they'll say something like 90, 10, 15, 85, something like that, right? And then I'll ask them, well, how do you define new revenues? Is it strictly new logos or is it new, new wallets within existing accounts and so on? But the very next question that I'll ask them is that, you know, if I looked at your 2015 plan, what was your plan when, when, you know, January 1st? And they generally, I don't know if it's an MBA thing or whatever, but they say 80-20. But with two very innocent questions and not poking for pain, I don't have my rubber gloves on ready to poke and all that. By the way, customers know when you're probing for pain. Sure. So, you know, they put their defenses up. Right. But with two simple questions, they've just told me that they have a gap between where they are and what their objectives are. Because they want to be at 80-20, but they're only at 85-15. So that then allows me to, again, continue this dialogue of actually letting the customer talk. And I say, well, what do you attribute that to? And they tell me all the things that I knew in the parking lot coming in. But if I pitch it, it sounds bad. If I if I ask the right questions around what the gaps are, what they attribute it to, and so on, they begin to share a lot of information with you, a lot more than you would be suspecting that they would. And then once those things are on the table, I then ask them, well, if we were to a able to get you to those objectives and eliminate some of the, th the, the things that you attribute to preventing you from getting there, what would that look like? What would be the possibilities? And I encourage salespeople to go way beyond their product. You know, help them understand all the things that would be there if they got closer to their objectives. And, you know, is it a question of market shares? Is it a question of margins? Is it a question of personal bonus? If they're in a public company and they exceed quota, are they going to get better stock options or whatever the case might be? So get beyond your product. You know, I always say leave your product in the car. You know, you can leave the window open if you want to let it breathe, but go in armed with these type of questions. And then you have to introduce risk into the, to the equation as well. So I always say, and, you know, what happens if you don't fix this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can introduce risk without necessarily hitting them over the head with a mallet. Um, so they begin to think, you know, can I risk another quarter at missing the target or whatever the case is? And by this time, I've got them opening up and, and actually feeling comfortable with sharing information with me and so on. And then the last thing that I do is I want to monetize this gap. And I ask them, you know, what would that mean to you if you were actually able to get to where your target was in financial terms? And then I extrapolate that out over the next two, three years, because if I train them and their average tenure of a rep is three years, they're going to get the benefit of that for three years. And what I find is often at the end of that line of questions, they say to me, is that something you can help me with? And I think that every salesperson in B2B, I can't speak for a consumer, could probably use a similar line of questions if they understood what the objectives of their customers were. Mm -hmm. But most of them don't take the time to understand those. Well, I love the way you've positioned that because you're, again, as you talk about, you're not talking about a problem, you're talking about an objective. Right. Now, what's, getting, what's preventing them from getting there could be a traditional problem or pain or whatever, but just I find a different approach allows them to talk about it differently. You know, I'll give you a generic example that everybody listening to this can use, you know, mm -hmm. by the end of the uh, podcast, but do listen to the end of the podcast. Um, when I go in and I have no idea, which is rare and I shouldn't go in and have no idea, but it does happen, then I might say, you know, Andy, I'm curious, if we were here 18 months from now and you were telling me that your team had hit a grand slam, what would that look like? And it's interesting to just watch their body posture because you're letting them go to a safe spot. It's 18 months out. Mm-hmm. You know, they're watching their team hit a grand slam. They start telling you, like, you know, da da da, it would look like this, it would look like that, blah, 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 blah. Basically, they're telling you their objectives, right? Because they're projecting into the future. And the hardest part for most salespeople is to let the person actually complete the thought. And sometimes it takes them 10 minutes to complete the thought, but great fodder. Like, think about it. During those 10 minutes when they're telling you what nirvana looks like, you know, there's a lot of great information coming if you just let, give them the time to talk. And then when they're finished, I always say, so why aren't we there now? And I always say we because I want to be part of mm -hmm. the team. And they'll start telling you what the things are in the way of where they want to be. They just describe perfection. And you ask them a legitimate question, why aren't you there now? And they tell you why they're not there now. And I'm willing to bet anybody that tries that will find that there'll be two or three things on the table that they could sell to. Perfect. All right. We'll put that bet out there. Have people get to me. Try, try Tibor's methodology and let me know how it works. And if you like it, do it more. Call me. 
Yeah. And yeah, yeah and do it. <laughs> go to go to Tibor's website and let him know. All right, we're gonna wrap up with some rapid fire questions here. What's the most powerful sales tool in your arsenal? Curiosity. Name one tool you use today for sales or sales management that you can't live without. Uh, Gmail. Who's your sales role model? You know, it's probably not from sales. I'm a freaky guy. You know, I'd have to say Frank Zappa or Ian Anderson. Right. Probably Ian Anderson. Ooh, I love that. Jethro Tull. Here we go. Yeah. What's the one book that every salesperson should read? The 10-Day MBA. Your favorite mu- music to listen to to psych yourself up for a sales call? We already mentioned it. Jethro, Jethro Tull. Tull. All right. Aqualung. That's my favorite. Uh, thick as a brick. Yeah, yeah, probably, okay. be- probably more apt to sales. You know? All right. <laughs> What's your favorite social media tool and why? Um, Hootsuite, because it allows me to manage a whole bunch of different things that I need to manage on uh, on social media. What do you do to keep fit and healthy? Well, before my ankle was decimated on April 12th by two guys who decided to drag race and hit me head on at 100 miles an hour. Um, Wait, I was in a, I a was car, in a, car, cra- car crash? Yeah. Oh, geez Louise. So prior to April 12th, I was a runner. Um, doing half marathons and 10Ks. Since April 12th, I'm pretty good with crutches. Don't get in my way. I could put up a pretty good clip, but I plan to go back to it um, once I start rehabilitating the ankle, probably later in the month, starting with swimming and stuff. So, But hopefully, if you ask me the same question in a year, I'll be able to say running again. All right, we'll have you back on. We'll ask the question. So the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople it's not a question. It's, it's a question, but it's a response like, can you really do that? So mm-hmm. when I suggest that they do things, and I always tell people that nobody's ever died or lost limbs or gotten injured doing any of the techniques that I suggest that they do. Um, but when I ask them to do certain things, especially, again, when it comes to prospecting and cold calling, they ask me, can you really do that? And I always say, yeah, you know, I went to Washington, San Cremento, Ottawa, checked out all the legislation on the book. And yes, you can legally do that if you want to. So it's that question. Can you really do that? Yeah. And yes, Virginia, you can. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I've been physically escorted out of customers' offices before, but uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to no at least harm do your job? Yeah. I've been, yeah, I've been asked not to come back, but, you know, no, no, no injury. I'll tell you, there was one account once that told me never to come back, and six months later, they asked the company to put me back on the account because they realized that the assertiveness cut both ways and their service levels declined when I wasn't on their account. So they asked for me to come back. Yeah, I had something similar. I, I uh, parked myself in the parking lot and waited for the CEO in his car uh, late into the evening. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he didn't like that, but we eventually got the order. There you go. All right. Last question for you. And then we'll let you go is what do you consider your greatest success outside of work? Outside of work, uh, my kids, you know, my family and my kids. Good. How many kids? Three kids, two boys and a girl. Are they still at home? They're still at home. Uh, one's just finished school and, and began a job in sales of all things. And the hardest part is not to give him any instruction and let this company <laughs> train him. Right. And, and one in university and one just finishing high school next year. Oh, great. That's perfect. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. Our guest has been Tibor Shanto. And Tibor, tell people how they can get hold of you. Um, they can get a hold of me the easiest, as you mentioned earlier, on my website, which is sellbetter.ca. Um, or you can email me at tibor.shanto at sellbetter.ca. Or if you want, pick up the phone and dial plus one four one six eight two two seven seven eight one. Or text them at that number, right? That's right. All right. So thanks for coming. Remember, everybody, great. go ahead. So I was going to say it was great fun. I enjoyed it. It went fast. Yeah. Well, thanks. So make it a part of your day every day to learn something new to help you accelerate your sales. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.